So that was the general perception of Digbeth when I moved there in March 2007. You know, it's an old industrial area, um, a lot of old factories and, and manufacturing places, a lot of them closed down. Not many people, not many amenities, not much going on. And I think, you know, when people thought of Digbeth, they just, this kind of tumbleweed just sort of rolled <laughs> through their brain. That, that's, that was kind of their perception of Digbeth. It was a bit scruffy and, and there wasn't that much going on there. Um, but I knew a different story really and uh, as I lived there and kind of explored the area a bit more I, I kind of knew there was a lot more going on underneath the surface so um, it was fast becoming a creative quarter of the city a lot of arts organisations and galleries were taking advantage of the cheaper rents and moving into the area and, and creating new creative spaces and art galleries and, th and there was quite a lot of interesting things going on um, and you know very soon there were more than five art galleries within the space of a couple of miles, uh, which you don't really see that often outside of London, to be honest. Um, it's also traditionally the Irish Quarter. It's where the um, Irish worked when they moved over from the 50s to the 70s. And um, there's still great remnants of that, particularly the independent Irish pubs in the area. Um, so, so they're still going strong. The Irish Centre is there. And every year, the whole area gets completely taken over. Uh, by by a St Patrick's Day parade, it's such a you know really huge affair, and it's also got a very tight knit community. So on the far right, that's the, the culmination of the annual Digbeth Olympics, which are these completely anarchic games, and they took place on Sunday actually, and they're just these really bizarre events such as welly wanging, snail racing, and soapbox racing down Bradford Street, which is highly legal and dangerous, but really good fun, and and all the local pubs get together and just arrange that every year. Um, so, a friend of mine suggested that it might be a good idea to, to create a site just to chart everything that was going on and, and bring that all into one space and just to, to make more people aware of all this great stuff that was going on in the area. Um, so Pete Ashton helped me uh, set up a website called digbeth.org, digbeth, digbeth is good, um, and it's just a simple WordPress site. And I just started posting all of these things that were going on. So arts happenings, if there was an art opening or an art launch or something, I'd post, post that on there. Um, Irish Heritage Group. Um, I, I'm a big fan of, of the Irish Heritage uh, Group in Birmingham that meets every month. And they're just these really good events talking about Irish culture and, and elements of Irish history. Um, so I was going along there and just um, filming it with my flip. And, uh, and quite soon kind of... New, new faces started to appear at their events because they got a taste of, of this kind of hidden gem that was going on. And, and also just community news. So what you can see on the far right is Digbeth's first free-to-use cash point. Um, basically, for years, Digbeth didn't have a free-to-use cash point. We'd have to pay £1.80 to get our own money out. It was really frustrating. Um, and Michael, a local shopkeeper, he, cr he convinced NatWest to install a free-to-use cash point in there. And we had an opening for the cash point, um, so basically about 20 people showed up to the grand launch of this cash point. We had like ribbon cutting, and, and the landlord of the local anchor pub, Jerry, he agreed to lay on cash point real ale. Um, so after we opened the cash point, we went round to the anchor and just toasted it with this cash point real ale. Um, obviously that's not big news probably for the Birmingham Mail, um, but for, for people who lived in Digworth, the, the arrival of a free cash point was, was pretty major to us. And I also wanted to talk about the area's characteristics, and, and I think this, you know, this is quite common for, for people from anywhere. They, they feel that there's something about their area that makes it unique and sets it apart from anywhere else. Um, so, so I just wanted to kind of draw that out and just have a bit of fun with it, really, because I think when you do something voluntary like this, it's got to be fun. Um, otherwise, you'll soon lose interest and, and you know, you, it'll become more of a chore um, than a pleasure, which, which it should never be. Um, so when Gordon Brown was trying to convince us to be frugal with our food, I found a plate of mutton curry outside the Irish Centre. So I took a picture of it and said, uh, Gordon says no to food saving. And um, I kept finding more and more food. So that's his own category on the site, dig with food wastage. And later I kept noticing that I wasn't just finding food, but bits of random crap. So um, that became the dig per shop of found items. Um, and it's a bit of a take off of the bag per shop. And also characters, you know, people who 
if they were suddenly to leave the area that you know you'd feel there was something missing if they weren't there and one of those is definitely Mr Ralph he's a, a local peddler rumour has it he has um, the last remaining peddler's licence from Birmingham City Council and he just wanders around from pub to pub with these suitcases full of Mr Ralph branded goods and all, all the pub landlords know who he is so he always gets, kind of gets fed in water wherever he goes so off, I'd been doing this for about a year and then I got contacted by Will Perrin who does a similar site in King's Cross called King's Cross Environments and he contacted me and he said, oh, you've, you've created a hyper-local website and I was like, oh, really? That's nice, you know, because it wasn't really a term then. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said he'd been doing his site in, at kingscrossenvironment.com in uh, King's Cross since about 2003 and he'd very much come at it from a community activism angle um, he was living in an area with a lot of problems, a lot of antisocial behaviour and crime and fly tipping and the like. Um, and he was using the website to kind of combat that and bring, you know, the, 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 the campaigning activities of a lot of different kind of residence groups and, and organisations together into one space. So, you know, one, one knew what the other was doing and, and could kind of come together on that. And Will told me about... Oh. It doesn't seem to be... Frozen. Yeah, did that happen a lot? It's a work laptop, so yeah, probably. Thanks. <laughs> what do I do? I don't know, actually. Is it control delete? Mm. Oh, that's, oh, that's okay. Um, anyway, Will told me about other websites across the country that had sprung up um, from people just using very simple blogs or websites uh, to create a local kind of news or, or, or community site. Um, and there was Pits and Pots in Stoke-on-Trent by my colleague Mike Rawlins, um, and he used it really to hold his local authority to account. He described the area as kind of politically broken. I think their first elected mayor was actually arrested on corruption charges, although he's later cleared, I believe. Um, so, so, and the far right were quite big there. The BNP um, in the last general election actually launched their, their general election campaign there. Um, so, so he used the site very much to, to kind of hold the local council to account, um, you know, scrutinise what they were doing and how they were doing it. Um, also, parwitch.org. Um, this is a really lovely site in a small village in Derbyshire. Um, called Parwich and uh, basically there's about 500 people in the village and it gets about 400 hits a day and apparently people kind of knock on each other's doors to talk about what they've read on the website, it's a really <laughs> lovely site and there's a lot of kind of local colour on there so um, there's an ornithologist who's always pus- posting up pictures of birds and flora and fauna, it's really lovely. Um, the Archers recently uh, have created a fake village website for Ambridge and um, this was one of the websites that they've been looking at to, to inform that fake village Ambridge website. And Haringey Online, this is a new network created uh, by Hugh Flouch in Haringey in London. He started this out of frustration because he couldn't find any parking spaces and it's just become this huge network of about 2,000 members um, talking about local issues and local problems. So Will created the Talk About Local project with funding from Channel 4 IP, the digital innovation branch of Channel 4, and we um, set up a partnership with UK Online Centres. And basically it was um, very much an approach where we were training trainers in this kind of training pyramid, um, trying to roll those skills out so they were more widely available because we noticed that the people that were using it were using pretty simple stuff to do what people do anyway, which is is um, community activism and just getting local news and local information out. Um, But those skills weren't widely known about, Um, so people still had this mindset often that a website was something that was quite technically hard to build, you you know, the old days of building it from scratch, or it was something that you had to pay someone to do, and and neither of those is true anymore with, with WordPress blogs and the like out there. Um, so we've been doing that since 2009, just um, training people in communities and trainers in, in how to create kind of local groups and websites online. And quite a few websites have come out of the back of that. Uh, the first one was the Kington Blackboard. Um, this is uh, in Kington in Herefordshire. Uh, the reason it's called the Kington Blackboard is because it actually was a physical blackboard um, that stood in the centre of the village, and that's where people posted up news. 
Um, unfortunately, when so there were certain crux of people who wanted to control local news. So when someone wrote something on the blackboard that they didn't like, they'd kidnap it and, and run away with it and then put it back once they'd rubbed it clean. <laughs> um, so, so we helped them create this virtual blackboard and it really blew up because suddenly there was this blackboard that people couldn't rub clean anymore and it was this open discussion talking about what was going on locally. Um, so yeah, it's really kind of helped local democracy come on in leaps and bounds really. Um, this is a site w14london.ning.com um, created by Annette who you can see there in, in West Kensington States in London. Um, it's an area that's undergoing a lot of regeneration and there's a lot of um, you know, local nervousness around that. Will the communities be split up? Will, you know, will quite tight communities find themselves living on the opposite ends of town when that regeneration is completed? Um, the area is suffering quite badly from cuts, so there's a lot of amenities that are being shut down, such as the libraries and community <coughs> centres are under threat. Um, so, uh, as well as kind of members posting up things here about local kind of goings on, like the local dog show, it's being used quite a lot for campaigning as well. So, there's a lot of online um, petitions and the like being set up on here. Um, it's happening in Healy. Uh, this is a website we helped a group in Sheffield set up. Um, there's a local newsletter called The Healy Voice. It's been going since uh, 1971. And they just wanted an online version of that newsletter um, to lessen the need for kind of copying and distribution, which can be quite cumbersome to do. Um, so they started just taking the articles and posting those up as individual posts on this website. Um, and that, that actually kind of made that information more widely available and meant they didn't have to copy and distribute so many, many physical newsletters. Um, and then they s actually since lost the funding for the physical newsletter. So while they're trying to find an alternative source of funding, this is the only version of the newsletter that's available, I think, at the moment. And this is the Rosmini Centre in Wisbeach in Cambridgeshire. It has a large Eastern European co um, population. So it's kind of a half English, half Polish site. Um, it's run by a Polish guy called Thomas, um, and he puts all the notices up in English and Polish. And we found that's one of the beauties of WordPress is it does support pretty much any language that's out there. And we've done quite a bit of work more locally as well. Um, so this is Let's Talk B8. We work with a, a UK online centre called the Evolution Centre in Allen Rock. And um, it seems to be a youth centre, or a lot of kind of kids are hanging out there. And um, the guy we were working with, Basharat, he created this Ning network for them to pretty much just come in and talk to each other um, when they weren't physically at the Evolution Centre. Um, and some of the discussions on there are really interesting. A lot of it is kind of these, these kids coming on and talking in text speak of, oh, I had a good day at school today, but I didn't enjoy lunchtime because I got detention. And then Basharat will come in and say, well, you, you should behave better then, shouldn't you? Um, there's a lot of, there's, there's a also kind of quite interesting discussions on there about local kind of crime and gangs and that sort of thing and, and how young people uh, feel about what's going on around them locally. This is very dark, um, but this is the um, Karma Village Festival in Walsall. It's a yearly festival run on a voluntary basis. And we just helped um, members of the festival committee create a, a simple WordPress site. And they used this to pretty much organize the festival. So um, basically all of those notices you have to send to all of these different you know, groups and individuals that are involved in making this big festival happen. Um, they, they just put the notices on the site. So there was a central point. Um, so you know, this is where you should park if you've got a stall. This is where you should come for auditions for this thing. Does anyone have any ideas on who we should put on this stage? It just bore all of that kind of communication and the admin around that into one central point, and it meant no one was missed out, and it was all kind of publicly available for anyone to kind of see and get involved with things. And then they used they've since used it for um, coverage of the festival, and I think <coughs> they've done quite a bit of work with Flickr as well. Um, creating flick groups, so get, getting pe you know attendees' photos of the festival on that. And sometimes this is Karen's site, Wake Green Park. Um, sometimes, ba basically, we haven't really done much um, in terms of kind of training or, or training sessions to to help people create blogs. Sometimes it can just be encouragement, really. 
um, and, and just kind of support as and when people need it. So, Karen, you, you created the Wake Green Park blog, and mm -hmm. I think we gave, you know, there were a couple of phone calls yeah. around. Um, well, Nikki's Big Fish um, blog inspired me to, to start my hyper-local blog about the estate I live in in Mosley. It, it covers a very kind of small area, it's got about 300 residents or so, so I, I, I just started it on a um, blogger platform and um, quite shortly afterwards um, some of the board of directors <laughs> which are made up of um, retired people that live on the park that sort of make decisions about how the parks run and where, where our sort of monthly maintenance fee goes. They got wind of it and didn't really like what I was doing and raised some objections. Um, they were concerned about security risks. So we were talking about the blog, who's going to talk about the park, who's going to see it. Um, you know, that might encourage people to come into the park and steal things or whatever. <laughs> and I, I, at the same time, I was proposing a. Uh, a big lunch, that's that's something that's held every year um, across the UK, people in communities get together um, just to have a big lunch and get to know each other, etc. So I was organising that and I was concerned about that as well. So it was that point that I got in touch with um, talk about local and spoke, spoke to Nikki and saying, oh, do you want to shut me down? We don't really want to be doing this. And then uh, Nikki and then Will and Mike gave me advice about it and uh, so I kept on going and I kind of spoke to the board of directors and um, I had a, had a bit of a meeting with them and said no look you know not doing any harm it's not you know it's not done to be disrespectful to the park it's done to bring the community together because although there's um, you know quite a few residents on the park we don't often interact with each other you don't really pass each other in the mm -hmm. corridors of the flats or anything so it's a it was an aim. The aim was to to sort of get ha have a place online for people to share the stories or concerns or you know about any issues that might be going on in the park. And now um, the board of directors have have sort of turned turned their views right around, and they actually like it and support it now. And sometimes come to me with, with ideas and things like that. So it's it's only. It's a small blog. There's not much breaking news going on at all, and I update it as and when I can. But it, it's it's there and it runs along in the background, um, and I always sort of invite residents to contribute if they contribute to it if they want to. Um, and it's it's not only kind of local websites that we're helping people to create. Um, so so sometimes we'll we'll help them to do you know create something in Facebook. Um, I mean fa Facebook, I personally don't like the way it works um, but you know if, if you want to, to find people and, and people locally um, then then that's Facebook often is where local people are so so it, you know it's a space you really need to be using um, if, if you're trying to, to kind of build a, com a community of, you know around online um, if a lot of local people are on Facebook so we worked with um, this group um, what's on Offerton in Stockport just help them create this simple uh, Facebook open group um, and it's now got 357 members um, you know, it's, it's just simple things like um, photos of like a cheerleading event um, discussions on um, local parking or, or dog poo which is always very popular on local sites um, that sort of thing uh, a lot of open discussion just happens on here and, and everyone's just free to get involved and post up whatever they want and, and it often works really well um, also more locally, we've recently helped um, the Friends of the Bull and Markets. Uh, they showed up at a Digbeth Residents Association meeting and they created this WordPress site, but they were a bit unsure of, of kind of finding their way around the dashboard and certain things they could do technically with it um, and a bit unsure of kind of the widgets option on the WordPress dashboard. So we just um, held a session with them and, and just helped them with some technical aspects of, of how to lay out the site and, and what the different features they could use on it. Um, but we also help them, um, you know, think about the content a bit more um, because it's a, a campaign to um, save the the bullring wholesale markets uh, that are currently under threat. They're marching as we speak. Oh. Are they? Yeah. yeah. On the conference yeah. Right now. Um, and I mean, the bullring markets—they—they've been. How long have they been there now? More than hundred years. Yeah. 
And you know, the, they're absolutely huge. And if, if the bullring market's closed, there won't be any wholesale markets in Birmingham, basically. They've done really well as well. Mm. Uh, I think more than 10,000 signatures on their petition. And we've done a, a small online petition as well to track back in. So they've obviously got the, the big impact. Mm. They must have a big following. They must have a big um, and we, we just kind of spoke with them about, you know, telling the stories of the boring markets just to illustrate, you know, how important it currently is and the impact losing that would have, um, you know, so to talk to, to wholesale traders, to, to customers, um, to traders in the uh, rag markets and, and, and the indoor markets who rely on the wholesale markets really for, for their supplies. Um, so, so just to really keep telling story after story after story that illustrates the importance of, of the boring markets and the need for them to stay over stay open even. Um, so Carol's been going around with her camera um, and getting different stories like this. I'll just play. Are the speakers on on this? I don't know. Let's have a look. Brilliant. So, I mean, we, we just basically just encourage Carol to, to really start running around with her camera and taking videos and, and, and photos and ju just really illustrate kind of what made, made the, the markets kind of an integral part of, of Birmingham and, and, you know, what, what was at stake here really. And, and she's really gone for it. I mean, she's been running around with her video camera just interviewing pretty much anyone she can get her hands on and just come up with some great stuff like that. He didn't carry that photograph everywhere he goes, was it? I don't know. <laughs> well, he, I think he said he bought it for someone who didn't believe him. Well, I, 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 I can't. I can't I don't, I'm not sure why he was carrying that photo around. I'm not sure she was sure either. Um, but it's it's pretty great. Um, so that's what we do essentially. Um, and basically, um, we've carried on now. I mean, we've um, we're still working with UK online centres and training trainers within within, within UK online centres. Um, but now we're uh, working with kind of other larger organisations as well, so local authorities, housing associations, pretty much anyone who's interested in, in helping their local communities find a voice online. Um, and so we're working with them, helping people you know, create effective websites or say a Facebook presence of where they are. Um, so yeah, that's it. And if anyone's got any questions, that's all.